This evening we meditate the seven sorrows of our Blessed Mother. It's very important that we remember that sorrows do not necessarily mean that Our Lady is sad. And that's exactly the point I want to make, is that in the sorrows of our Blessed Mother, we find a certain happiness. And the reason she has this happiness is that she knows that she is fulfilling the will of God perfectly for herself, as our Lord Jesus Christ is fulfilling God's will perfectly for himself. So there's a happiness in fulfilling God's will. That's why you see us using the color white for the vestments, uh, even though we're meditating on the sorrows of our Blessed Mother. So this is Friday of Passion Week, as you know, and it has been chosen as the day to commemorate Our Lady's sorrows. Because next week, which is Holy Week, we will be completely taken up with thinking about our Blessed Lord and his passion and death. Therefore, we wish to pay due honor to the Mother of God by recalling to our minds this great truth, that God, in the designs of his infinite wisdom, has willed that Mary should have a share in the work of the world's redemption. If we think back to the time of Eve, our first mother, who committed the first sin, followed by Adam. At the suggestion of the serpent, our Lord told that, or sorry, God, the Father, told the serpent on that same day that a woman will crush your head. God the Father was thinking already of his own mother. And God said, God was thinking of his own mother. And Our Lady has been crushing the devil's head ever since her immaculate conception. But we're certain that in these sorrows, she was really crushing his head. There are three moments in the redemption, in the story of our redemption, in which Our Lady was called upon to take part in what God himself did. The first time was the incarnation or the annunciation, which we celebrated just a couple weeks ago. When the angel told Our Lady, what God had in mind, that she would become the mother of the Redeemer, Our Lady knew that when she said, when and if, she said yes, that wouldn't be just becoming the mother of the Redeemer, or even the mother of him who is the Son of the Most High, which is certainly a huge privilege. But with every privilege, there comes a great charge. Our Lady knew that the charge or the responsibility would be, you've got to go through all the pains of the redemption just as much as our Lord Jesus Christ, in as much as any human being can do. Our Lady knew that. And without any hesitation, when she understood that this message came from God, she said yes. So that's the first part of our redemption in which she had such an important part to play. The second, which is what we're thinking of this evening, is when she offered her son on the cross, taking part in the expiatory sacrifice. Our Lord came into this world because Our Lady said yes. She would accept the responsibility of going through every pain of the redemption that a human being could go through along with our Lord and not leave anything out. All of us, human beings, Catholics, we go through the pains of the redemption too. When we pray the fifth sorrowful mystery, the, the death on the cross, to give ourselves completely for the redemption of sinners, we go through it too. With every difficulty we have in life, a lot of them are the result of our own selfishness, but we have difficulty, we have sorrow, we have pain, and sometimes we do accept it and offer it up. Many times we don't. But our Blessed Mother never left any room for not completing what God had in mind for her for any sorrow. And that's why she is the... The, the, the co-redeemer, the one that best offered herself up with our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And uh, we're called to do the same thing. And we do some of this work, hopefully good. A lot of it we turn down. But hopefully we're doing some part in sharing with Our Lady the pains of the cross. And the third time when Our Lady was called upon to uh, participate in the, work, in the work of the redemption is at the descent of the Holy Ghost, or Pentecost, when she was with the apostles, in order that she might effectively labor in the establishment of the church. 
But to come back to the sorrows of Our Lady, this evening we meditate, in particular, the fifth sorrow of Our Lady, which is the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Simeon had told Our Lady when our Lord was first born, or rather at the presentation 40 days after his birth, Prophet Simeon had told Our Lady that the Christ child was a sign of contradiction, that he was set for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and that she also would go through suffering with him. This was a heart-rending prophecy, which was, was fulfilled every day of our Lord's life, but especially at Calvary. He was, uh, the family was poor. They were rejected by many people in society around them. They were living in a poor village. And then finally our Lord came to manhood and he was reje rejected by his own people. But there was never a moment when it comes to the passion of our Lord, there was never a moment of his passion in which our Blessed Mother did not accompany him either physically or morally. She knew about Judas's betrayal. She knew about her son's agony in the garden and would have gone through the same agony in a different place. She knew about his trial before Caiaphas and the wicked jeers of the rabble on the road to Calvary. Our Lady, who had given birth to him and fed him, who had reared him all the years of his youth, was not going to abandon him during these most important moments of his life, even though they were so miserable, even though they were so tragic. Our Lady had reared, had brought up our Lord Jesus Christ for one purpose, to see him offered in sacrifice. And even though that's a very difficult thought, even a bit repugnant, how could someone be treating someone so tenderly, so softly, and so much affection, so much attention, and so much sorrow when he needed it, and knowing, and even, I'm sorry, and also happiness and joy, as he is a normal child, our blessed Lord was, knowing that all of this is going to culminate, all of this is going to come to its purpose in seeing him put to death in the worst way and by his own people. Uh, but Our Lady said and understood that's why he's come into the world. He's come into this world to free the world from sin by this sacrifice on the cross, and I'm going to do everything possible to make that sacrifice of the cross happen. Until we actually get to the point of the crucifixion that Our Lady is offering up her son on the cross in a way that we get the idea Our Lord would not have gone to the cross if it weren't for his blessed mother offering him up as she stands at the foot of the cross. We insist, we insist on that in the Stabat Mater, that Her Lady stands at the foot of the cross, looking directly up at her son. No swooning, no fainting, no writhing on the ground, I mean, uh, fits of despair or something like that, no, no, none of that. Looking straight up at her son, she offers him up on the cross, thanks to her. And... We might get the idea, well, she's doing that because she's being completely obedient to God and she's doing it because she has to. But it's not true. She is offering up her son on the cross in this fifth sorrow because she's being obedient to God, yes, but she's doing it because she wants to. We are grateful to, and we are indebted to the mother of God for making sure that the crucifixion happened and that it was offered up in such a pure way because she was offering her son. And throughout, throughout all of this, all of us should sort of be here, we should be hearing this invitation or this um, inspiration in our conscience which says, well, if the mother of God, who is the mother of sinners, the uh, redemption of the, 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 the mother of all of us sinners is doing that to be the most obedient and most submissive person to the will of God, and that's what sanctifies her, then all of us 
in imitation of the mother of God, should be offering up our Lord Jesus Christ too. And how do we do that? We offer up all the sorrows of our life along with him on the cross. And if we were not to offer up all of our sorrows and difficulties, I don't know what all, in our life, out of imitation of the mother of God, we would somehow be leaving her there alone, standing in front of the crucifix without help. So therefore, all of us should be feeling some sort of invitation to make this out of our lives also. When our Lord's body was nailed to the cross and finally lifted up as a sacrifice to his Father, Our Lady was allowed to approach and behold the horrible sufferings of her Son. He had been the tender and innocent fruit of her womb, and now she must behold him suffering at the hands of those he wishes to redeem. And she must join her sentiments to his. She must pay for the sinners that are crucifying her son. And she did it all willingly. Remember that the sorrows of our, not, of our Lady are not something sad. The sorrows of Our Lady are something that make her happy because she is fulfilling the will of God. While Our Lady looked on her son, looked on as her son suffered for three hours on the cross, we may consider these words of St. Bernard. The intensity of Our Lady's sufferings surpasses all that a bodily passion could produce. Just her son's words that now we sinners are to belong to her, uh, woman, behold thy son, and then to the disciple, behold thy mother. Just these words that we sinners are to belong to her rather than the son of God, the son of her womb, must have pierced her heart more thoroughly than any material sword. She must give up the sinless incarnation in exchange for sinful men. And for this reason, Our Lady was a martyr in her soul. When the soldier, when the soldier thrust a spear in the breast of Our Lord's sacred corpse, it only opened his side. But for Our Lady, who is still alive and conscious, a sword pierced her very soul. When she received the body of her son placed on her lap again, the body was cold, mangled, bleeding, and dead. She gave reverence to his sacred wounds like we would adore the sacred host. But oh, with what intensity of grief. So my friends, it is no coincidence that Our Lady was at the foot of the cross. It was not just something extra, something to help us in our devotions and something to, you know, if we can't understand all the, the male uh, strength and firmness of our Lord Jesus Christ suffering on the cross, then perhaps we can understand the female pity and misery of Our Lady and that somehow brings us closer to the crucifix and that helps us. It might have that element, but that's not what it's all about. What it is all about is that this is the woman who is a human creature like we are, who holds back nothing about offering up her soul along with the soul of her son. To the extent that, thanks to her sufferings along with her son, at the foot of the cross, and thanks to the fact that she's offering him up on the cross, our Lord makes use of her to dispense to all of us the fruits and merits of the crucifixion. Again, we are indebted to our Blessed Mother for accompanying our Lord to the cross and indebted to our Blessed Mother for offering up her Son on the cross for us. And through all of this, she was the most willing a cooperator in the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lady's presence at Calvary is something necessary. Eve, our first mother, brought sin into the world as she stood beneath the forbidden tree and consented to the evil suggested by the serpent. In an atoning way, 
our Blessed Mother stands at the foot of the tree of redemption, the cross, offering up her son and her very life along with him in reparation for the world and to bring grace into the world. Eve brought, brought, brought sin into the world by eating from the forbidden tree. Our Blessed Mother brings grace into the world by offering up her soul at the foot of the tree of the cross. The two sacrifices, that of our Blessed Lord and that of our Blessed Mother, are forever joined together. The blood of the divine victim and the tears of the mother flow together for the redemption of mankind. In spite of all the feelings of her maternal heart, she gave back to the eternal father, to the, the divine treasure he had entrusted to her keeping. The sword pierced through and through her soul, but we were saved. And she, though a mere creature, cooperated with her son in the work of our salvation. And that is how Our Lady became the co-redemptrix. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.